Because of today's extended news, our programmes on BBC One are running 15 minutes later than shown in Radio Times. In 25 minutes, Tony Jacklin is the subject of Maestro, which follows the first of six programmes on turning points in science with Professor Heinz Wolf. Great experiments. <laughs> Remember, remember the 5th of November. More than anything, Guy Fawkes Night is a festival of burning. And to burn, fires need oxygen. The air around us is about four-fifths nitrogen and one-fifth oxygen. And to prove that it's the oxygen which is required for combustion, I've got a candle here burning in pure air. I'm now going to replace the air with 100% oxygen. And the flame becomes very much brighter candle burns much more quickly, really quite spectacularly so. But if I now replace the oxygen with pure nitrogen, the flame dims and dies. But fireworks don't work like bonfires, because they burn so fast that they can't possibly get enough oxygen from the air surrounding them. So a big set piece like this has to have its oxygen pre-packed within it and plenty of it. One of the main ingredients of fireworks is gunpowder. And gunpowder derives its oxygen from saltpeter, or potassium nitrate, as the chemists call it. Now, the nitrate contains the same two gases which surround us in the atmosphere. That's nitrogen and oxygen. But as this molecular model here shows, they are actually combined in the same molecule. Here we have one nitrogen surrounded by three oxygens, and these oxygens are particularly accessible to a chemical reaction. In this tray, I have some sulfur and some charcoal two of the constituents of gunpowder. But even though both of the components are at least theoretically inflammable, I'll have great difficulty in lighting it. Simply won't burn. In fact, it's even put my match out. Now over here, I have another tray, which in addition to the charcoal and the sulfur, also contains some saltpeter, potassium nitrate. Now if I mix these components together, More music, you will agree. <laughs> From saltpeter, we can make nitric acid, and with nitric acid, we can make a new range of very powerful explosives, like gel ignite here, which is nitroglycerin absorbed in collodion cotton. When we made gunpowder, we mixed potassium nitrate and the fuel, sulfur, and carbon as intimately as possible. In nitroglycerin, of which I've got a model here, the fuel, the carbon, and the hydrogen is surrounded in the same molecule by the nitrate groups, three of them here. So that a disturbance of the molecule will actually cause a powerful explosion. Now, I'm going to cause a powerful explosion because I'm in a quarry, and in front of me, there's a borehole 55 feet deep right to the bottom of the quarry. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is to drop down three cartridges of gel ignite. Here goes the first one, lined nicely with a borehole. Here goes the second one. And now for the last powerful salami. There he goes, lined up nicely. Recipe for Big Bang. To your three sticks of gelignite, 
add one detonator capsule, then top up with a little ammonium nitrate. Fill up another eight holes, check the coast is clear, and you're ready to go. Now to charge up the exploder. Ready to fire. Fire! I always wanted to do that. But nitrate isn't just about making big bangs. There's also another quite unexpected use for nitrates. As long ago as 1656, a cantankerous German, half chemist and half alchemist, called Johann Glauber, stated that saltpeter added to the soil made plants go faster. Unfortunately, his observation was premature. It had to wait 200 years or so, whilst other scientists tried to understand plant nutrition. The most commonly performed experiment was to burn some finely divided plant material completely. Then to analyze the ash, which showed minerals such as potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium. In 1840, the Doyong of European chemistry, Baron Justus von Liebig, summed up the current state of knowledge in a book, which stated that only minerals were needed to feed plants. Nitrates were necessary, as a plant could make them from the air. Farmers, however, did not agree with Baron Liebig. For centuries, they had put this stuff, palmier manure, on the soil in winter, and the crop was improved the following year. Farmyard manure is produced by animals kept under cover in the winter. Their feces and urine mixed with their bedding straw makes the manure. And by Liebig's time, scientists knew that it was rich in nitrate. There were just two schools of opinion, pro-mineral and pro-nitrate. The issue was settled here at Rossumstead Manor in Hertfordshire by a rich landowner, John Bennett Laws, and a chemist employed by him called Joseph Gilbert. Between 1843 and 1852, they conducted a classical series of experiments in this field, Bordborg, which has been under continuous cultivation ever since. Fortunately, Gilbert and Laws were inveterate record keepers, and many of the records are available in the library at Rosamstedt. They divided Bordborg into 19 parallel strips, as are shown in this diagram here. One plot was left quite untreated. Another plot was treated only with farmyard manure, and the remaining plots were each treated with various strengths of either a mineral or nitrate dressing. In 1844, the first crop of wheat was harvested, and it was found that the untreated and the mineral-treated plots yielded about 800 weights per acre, whilst the nitrate-treated plot yielded nearly half as much again, just as good, in fact, as that plot which had been treated with farmyard manure. What's more, the crop looked different. That's a mineral-treated wheat down on the left, and up on the right is a nitrate crop. It stores longer, and it has a heavier head. In 1855, Laws and Gilbert published a reply to Baron Liebig, in which a case for nitrate was overwhelmingly made. In Victorian times, most of the nitrate came from Chile, near to its borders with Bolivia and Peru. The caliche, or nitrate-bearing rock, was hacked from the rainless upland plateaus and shipped back to England. The voyage from South America was extremely perilous, especially around Cape Horn, and only the most hard-bitten sailors would attempt it, but the rewards were high, and millions of tons of nitrate were shipped back to Europe every year. When World War I broke out, 
the Germans had an acute need for nitrate, not only for explosives, but also to feed their population and supply the army. Only one thing stood in their way. The British Navy with its dreadnoughts, warships of immense firepower which blockaded the German ports. Most historians believe the lack of nitrate would have finished the Germans in a year had not been for one thing. They'd found a way of making nitrate synthetically. On the face of it, the problem of making nitrate should be a simple one. All one's got to do is to make the nitrogen and the oxygen air combine. But we already know that nitrogen is a very unreactive element and requires truly a prodigious amount of energy to make it combine with the oxygen. Not unexpectedly, nature has found their own way of doing it. Lightning makes some of the nitrogen and oxygen in the air combine to make oxides of nitrogen, which dissolve in rainwater to make nitric and nitrous acid, the parent substances of all nitrates. At the turn of the century, the nearest man-made thing to lightning was the electric arc. The arc does make some oxides of nitrogen, but an enormous amount of electricity is needed, and only 3% of it is converted into chemical energy. Only countries with huge supplies of hydroelectric power could hope to use this method. One of these was Norway, where the Birkeland Eid process used rows of electric furnaces to make oxides of nitrogen. It was successful for a time, but for every other country in Europe, it was impossibly expensive. Combining nitrogen with oxygen didn't work, and chemists had to find another method. The white tornado strikes again. And what's the magic ingredient? It's ammonia. Ammonia is used in many cleaning products because it attacks grease and helps to dissolve it. In its pure form, ammonia isn't a solution like this, but a gas made by combining hydrogen with nitrogen. Structurally, it's really rather like nitrate. You remember, in nitrate, we have a central nitrogen atom surrounded by three oxygen atoms. In ammonia, we have the same central nitrogen atom, but this time surrounded by three hydrogen atoms. The problem of making ammonia is, as ever, the inertness of nitrogen. Mix the two gases and nothing happens. Pass an electric arc through them and not enough ammonia is produced. The man who finally solved the problem of making ammonia lived at the turn of the century. He was a Prussian. In fact, he was almost a comic strip Prussian. Rigid and disciplinarian with a highly developed sense of patriotism, Fritz Haber looked just like the stereotype of a German professor. Nonetheless, he was a gifted teacher and a talented researcher. And in approaching the ammonia problem, he used the traditional weapons of the physical chemist, pressure, temperature, and a catalyst. The molecules in a gas mixture are widely spaced apart, and it's difficult for them to react together. In a sense, they're like people in the rush hour, all busily in motion, but not making much contact. but push those people closer together in a party, the interaction starts to take place. That's what pressure does to molecules. It reduces their room for maneuver. <laughs> Music is analogous to temperature. Heat gets the molecules moving faster, and the number of interactions is increased. But for really intimate contact, you need somewhere you can settle. And at the molecular level, this function is performed by a catalyst, a surface where molecules can combine to make new compounds. What Fritz Haber did was to define the temperature and pressure conditions for making ammonia and to find a catalyst, osmium, on which nitrogen and hydrogen could combine. 
This is a replica of Haber's laboratory apparatus. It was actually made in Haber's workshop and is now in the Deutsche Museum in Munich. It consists of three parts. The most important part is a reaction vessel in which hydrogen and nitrogen at a temperature of 600 degrees centigrade and at a pressure of 200 atmospheres in the presence of a catalyst are persuaded in part to combine into ammonia and are then pumped away into refrigeration unit. The ammonia which has been produced is condensed and can be drawn off as a liquid at the bottom here. The gases which haven't reacted are dried in this regenerator and returned to the process. The real breakthrough was that up to 8% of the feedstock gases could be converted into ammonia. And this made the process economically viable. And this is a monster which that apparatus has grown into today. Most of this mass of pipes and vessels is concerned with making pure hydrogen, usually from methane or natural gas. Nitrogen is obtained from the air, and both gases are pressurized in a compressor prior to synthesis. In this relatively insignificant vessel, the real action takes place. Here, hydrogen and nitrogen meet hot, under pressure, and most important, over catalyst, to unite to form ammonia. The ammonia gas is then cooled to liquefy it, and the liquid is stored under pressure. These days, the manufacture of ammonia is a relatively commonplace process in chemical industry. But in 1913, it was a very hard nut to crack indeed. This is Ludwigshafen in West Germany, home of the Badische Anilin und Soda Fabrik, or BASF, and one of the biggest chemical complexes in the world. In 1911, it was of more modest proportions. And it was here that Karl Bosch, a young chemical engineer, took on the formidable challenge of designing the hardware that would tolerate the high temperatures and pressures of Harvard's experiment. The first commercial ammonia plant opened at Ludwigshafen in 1913, and it carried on producing ammonia until 1982. Now it is only a ruin the wind whistling through the smashed brickwork. Nonetheless, you can still see one of the chambers where the giant pipes in which ammonia was made were housed. Today, one of these pipes stands in the grounds of BASF as a memorial to Bosch and the problems he had to overcome. The impetus of the time, of course, was to make nitrate. And so far, we've only made ammonia. But the chemists at the time already knew how to burn or oxidize ammonia into nitric acid. The experiment which we've set up here demonstrates this. In this bottle, there is a solution of ammonia gas in water. The air which is being bubbled through it picks up some of the ammonia gas, and this mixture passes down this tube here until it meets the catalyst. The catalyst is finely divided platinum in an inert base. Here, uh, the ammonia is oxidized or burnt into brown oxides of nitrogen, which we can see accumulating in this large bottle. And these brown fumes then pass down this tube here and dissolve in the water carried in the speaker to make nitric acid. In principle, the commercial process is exactly the same. Ammonia gas is pumped into a giant burner containing a platinum catalyst, and oxides of nitrogen are formed on its surface. It's a catalyst which is a critical element in the process. It has to be changed every three or four months, and each sheet of platinum gauze, alloyed with rhodium, another precious metal, costs about 10,000 pounds. In this tower, the oxides of nitrogen going up meet water coming down, and dilute nitric acid is formed at the bottom. Thanks to Harbour and Bosch, the Germans had this technology, and a war that should have lasted a year stretched on for four years of hopeless attrition. When the war was over, 
the Allies, particularly the British, rushed to take the secrets of ammonia from the Germans. And the first commercial British plant opened at Billingham in 1923. At first, the factory manufactured ammonium sulfate, since this can be converted to nitrate by soil bacteria. But gradually, more sophisticated fertilizers appeared. These fertilizers were one important factor in changing the relatively simple agriculture of the 30s to the agribusiness of the 80s, with its combine harvesters and its prairie-like fields of wheat, devoid of ditches, hedges, trees, or wildlife. Since 1983, the United Kingdom has been a net exporter of grain, and in the EEC as a whole, the notorious grain mountains continue to accumulate. Yet only a few thousand miles away, children die of hunger with appalling regularity. If this has been estimated, the world population doubles by the end of the century. It will require another 500 ammonia factories in order to mix a fertilizer which will allow us to double cereal production. And this, in turn, will require vast quantities of fast disappearing fossil fuels such as gas and coal. Clearly, it's time for another revolution. And this revolution may be brought about by plants such as this humble pea which is a member of a family called the legumes, which also contains beans, clover, and alfalfa. This pea plant is being grown in very nitrogen-deficient soil. Nevertheless, it is a healthy and vigorous plant. This oilseed rape, being grown in exactly the same soil, shows all the symptoms of nitrogen deficiency, stunted growth and discolored leaves. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that the pea plant, on its roots, has these tiny pink nodules. Just about see them. They're really rather, rather, rather pretty color. And it's these nodules which appear to give the plant the ability to fix nitrogen from the air. Actually, this is not quite true. In fact, the nodules are guest houses for colonies of a bacterium called rhizobium, which starts life in the soil. This is a greatly magnified electron microscope picture of a root hair of a pea. The white clots on the surface are clumps of rhizobium. They penetrate the wall of the hair and go down it, into the body of the root, where they multiply rapidly. The bacteria have the ability to combine hydrogen with nitrogen from the air to make ammonia, which is used by the plant instead of nitrate. In return, the plant supplies the bacteria with sugars as a food source. At the Nitrogen Fixation Unit of Sussex University, they have been studying rhizobium's secret weapon, an organic catalyst called nitrogenase, which can unite nitrogen and hydrogen without any of the huge temperatures and pressures needed in the Haber-Bosch process. Lately, they have been able to isolate the genes for nitrogen fixation and to move them around from one bacterium to another. Genetic engineering of this kind is still in its infancy. But would it be too fanciful to imagine that one day we may have wheat with nodules on its roots or able to fix nitrogen in the way the bacterium does? The hungry peoples of the world need some completely new solution. And its biological processes, which already fix 500 million tons of gaseous nitrogen per year, which could prove to be their salvation.